Welcome everybody and uh, very nice to have so many people with us. Um, I hope you can uh, see, can you see what I'm sharing at the moment? Yep. 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 So, um, excellent. So it doesn't actually show me what I'm sharing, so I have to remember what I'm sharing. So it should be a field of cows. So um, yeah, so Water Farm uh, is in North Wiltshire, quite close to the um, Gloucestershire border. So we're about between Sirencester and Swindon. And um, it's all permanent pasture. Uh, and as I said in my uh, little sort of intro that I sent round, um, it's about 75 hectares. So we're part of, um, so there's, there's, there's two farms within DW Rumming and Sun. And uh, we're about eight miles apart. And it's, we've got my uncle and aunt live in the farmhouse here. I live in uh, bungalow and my mum, dad and brother live just down the road, um, which uh, is also uh, sort of cattle based, but with a few other things going on. So it's, um, so we've got, you know, two generations and I've got kids, so there's three generations all together at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, lots of six partners in the business. My brother came in last year. Uh, both me and my brother have got other jobs as well. So we're part-time on the farm. Um, so yeah, lots of things going on, uh, lots of opportunities, but lots of challenges, like I'm sure many of your businesses really. Um, at the core of it has always been cattle. So both farms were small dairy farms. And then in the nineties, um, sort of with the onset of quotas, uh, the dairy herd here disappeared really quickly. Um, at Park Farm, it went on until I went to university, but we had quite a discussion about sort of the future of dairying with, uh, I think we had about 80 cattle. Um, and so that was packed up in the sort of late nineties. So like lots of dairy farmers, people moved on to um, suckler cows. It was the kind of natural reaction. And um, and that's what both uh, farms did. So one business, two farms, both had two suckler herds, so a spring and a uh, summer, uh, and both kept their own young stock. So there was four calving periods across the business, um, lots of things going on. So I came back in 2012 and um, I did a thing called the Challenge of Rural Leadership, which I know that Russ has done and some others. and. Um, it was a brilliant course and basically it's sort of renowned for people going on it. it's two weeks intensive course and then people kind of giving up their jobs or doing radical things and so i came back from that and thought right i need to just bite the bullet i need to get on and move back home and um, there's no perfect time let's just do it so um my wife said no because she was pregnant um and which is quite reasonable so we had my son or she had my son in the february and then we moved to the farm in the July. And so I still worked full time at that moment for the RPA in DEFRA. And anyway, uh, we, I went part time and here, this is sort of, you know, where we are. So the, the kind of real strength of our business is, um, so have you got a different cow on the screen now? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, excellent, right. Um, so is yeah we grow we grow grass so uh, it's sort of heavy clay um, and it, you know in normal years we grow grass really really well and so I was I thought you know this is this is we need to make more of this um, I was also quite interested in wildlife and bird watching and realised that it was really it's really interesting farm there's loads going on uh, wildlife wise and so um, yeah wanted to knew that whatever farming I did I wanted more wildlife, I want wildlife to be involved. I also quite like people. Um, and I was kind of appalled that our 100% grass fed cattle were being sold as heavy stores, at, you know, sometimes 700 quid, and they were getting towards 30 months old. And, you know, this is a waste. So my brother started, a, or me and my brother started a free range turkey business when I still lived in Exeter. And I used to come up to help him slaughter. And so he'd already established that, um, you know, direct marketing uh, was, was working for him. And so he, uh, I thought, well, let's try and do that with the beef. So um, I went on the Progressive Beef Group, 
with AHDB, which kind of was really interesting, showed you lots of different aspects of the beef industry or in Britain. Um, went on some pasture for life things. Well, Russ hassled me to join through Twitter, which was kind of the best thing I ever did. And then started direct selling beef. Uh, but also really kind of really got into the fact that, um, I guess the holistic management side of it, that actually you can knit all these things together and you can layer enterprises. Um, and so there's still loads of things I'm still on a huge learning curve and I guess we've been doing this about four years um, but yeah it's definitely a I think it's a more interesting business than it was um, the direct sales you know you realize so much more of the animal's value um, and the kind of mob grazing rotational grazing that's really exciting and um, yeah and it's yielding more wildlife which is great and there's loads more opportunities that kind of have sort of come our way in terms of doing events, uh, diversifications, all within a cattle theme. So um, it's all good. So I'm going to try and show you a little video. Um, so I tried to take some videos. These were actually taken yesterday. Um, sorry, sorry about the wind noise. What I'll do, I'll turn this down. So well, it's all crossbred cattle. Um, so we've got quite a lot of Herefords uh, types. Um, we've got Belgian Blue Cross Frisian, one right at the front here, which came from our next door neighbour's organic herds quite a few years ago. And then we've basically retained our own followers by using the Hereford Bull. So we switched to a stabiliser bull um, about three years ago because I knew that we needed to, we, you know, we grow really good grass, loads of grass. And so we can have actually a bit of a, a better cow, if I'm honest. We don't need something that survives on the top of a mountain. Um, and ah, so this, sorry, this is my electric fencing gear. So um, if I pause it, oh, sorry, just having mouse problems. Here we go. Right. Um, so we can have a, we can afford to have a slightly, um, yeah, we can have a, 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 a better cow. So we've started using the stabilizer bull to try and get better mothers. So mothers that were uh, needed less mollycoddling, that had a smaller frame, um, and that would produce, uh, yeah, be really a really good maternal traits, super fertile. And so that's what we've been doing. And we've been retaining. We bought in a few uh, heifers of stabilizer heifers. They weren't a great success. But breeding up using a stabiliser bull has been. So um, that's what we're doing. And yeah, fertility has improved, but that's not just down to the breeding, that's also down to the mob grazing. And also, I think, to uh, we've been paying a lot of attention to blood testing and uh, bolusing. So, anyway, so this is uh, the bunch that I look after, and these carve in July and um, August. Uh, and at the moment, um, so they're not going into very tall grass. This, in my book, this is, this is not really where I'd want to be. But we're using KiwiTech um, mobile uh, electric fencing. So this year I've put in a lot of, uh, homeschooling has been great because I've got the kids putting in these semi-permanent fences. Um, so they've got a hyper spring in, uh, which means they're really springy. And they've got these little gadgets on the ends. So you can open the ends and let the cows through, but the middle doesn't drop. And if anything challenges the fence, they kind of bounce back and you can you can drive over them actually if you put like skis on the front of your quad. We haven't got a quad, but I'm gonna make my bike so I can drive over them. Um, and um, yeah, so trying to get infrastructure, I think is really important. If you're gonna graze properly and you're not gonna to spend too much time moving fences, having some infrastructure is good. So I really love the sort of Kiwi tech, semi-permanent, and I also like the, uh, the cross stuff. That orange thing is a little homemade plate meter, um, which just sort of tells me the height of the grass, which I only use when I think something's not right, if I'm honest. Um, normally it should be off the top of the plate meter and basically doesn't work, but at the moment the plate meter works, which for me is not great. Um, so yeah, that just shows a little thong around a fence post, go into this little handle. Um, but yeah, so at the moment, there. this is a, how much should I get in? They're probably getting about an acre a day, and there is um, 40 cattle in there. Uh, and they are averaging 600 and, 
40 kilos and we weigh them all at weaning. We weaned them two weeks ago. Um, and so I'm very interested to know what percentage of the body weight the mother has weaned. So these lot are not performing as well as the others. Uh, they're doing about an average about 36%, but we've got ones in here that are doing 50%, 51%. But if they wean any less than 30%, um, I'm afraid their days are numbered. So we spend more time, I spend more time looking at the performance of the bottom really than the top. Um, and we carve it to, we don't keep anything round if it's empty. So I think we're, we're trying to exert quite a lot of selection pressure because we want animals that look after themselves and that thrive on a grass-based system and that are relatively small. Um, do stop me if I'm waffling, uh, Russ. Uh, other Thanks. pictures? Yeah, okay. Um, other pictures? So uh, I just wanted to show you, um, right, so, a third of our farm floods and when it floods it sort of really does flood um so this is a picture of uh come on right so um it's one of my field signs uh which i have these on my field gates with a little leaflet dispenser and sometimes the cows are even leaning over the fence advertising themselves so they attract the people to come and look at it they take a leaflet um, it's great. It, they work really well. Um, so this, yeah, this shows one of the fields partly flooded. Um, it can, this year has been, or last autumn was really severe flooding. So they started flooding at the end of September and some fields were underwater until March and we've paid big time for that. So on the floodplain this year, um, we have got a lot of docks um and a lot of bare ground which is uh which is not good at all really but you just have to kind of roll with the punches and sort of suck it up so this is my uh this is one of our floodplain meadows um this is actually really normally very species rich um it's where we have all our fertilities so normally there would have been about 500 snakes of fertilities in flower we had one in flower this year um, a lot of silt dropped and it's, yeah, it's not looking great. Um, and I'd lined up to do some seed harvesting for a seed company off it this year. But um, there we are. You just have to accept these things. Um, so, yeah, farming on the floodplain is, um, you know, I've, I've been a bit negative there, uh, but it can be. So when it looks, you know, when it all goes well, uh, this is what we see. So, you know, sort of purple in snakes and fertilities. Um, but yeah, you've just got to be adaptable, not get upset when you don't get that um, and kind of move on. Uh, now, the, let me just find what I was looking for. Oh yeah, so the, the, river, the river Thames flows in the middle of the farm. That's what it looked like yesterday. Uh, it's dropped a lot, so the water levels will be can be even over these fence posts that you can see in the background there. They were this winter, um, which makes for great canoeing opportunities in the winter. Me and my brother go canoeing uh, over other people's farms on the floods, um, go exploring. That's quite good. Um, we also get a huge number of um, winter birds, so we get uh, a lot of waders, a lot of ducks, um, and you get you know hectares and hectares of standing water which actually is a real uh, massive boon for uh, visiting birds um, not only to roost but to feed and so that's really good and so we tried to kind of lever the wildlife side and we have uh, so you haven't this year but in other years we've had um, dawn chorus walks and uh, these have gone really well so we do a dawn chorus walk you get you turn up at 5 a.m um, you get a sort of two and a half hour walk. Um, uh, this guy here is uh, one of our friends and he's a um, ecologist with the local water park trust and um, he kind of leads the walk and then we've got another guy who's the county bird recorder and both of them will work for kind of stakes so um, they kind of help with the ID and um yeah people have a nice time and then you get fried breakfast to finish 
Um, so normally my brother Chris runs back sort of about halfway through the walk to get the frying pans on. And when, when, it's, when we get to the end of the walk, everyone enjoys that. And it's all, you're done and dusted by nine o'clock in the morning. So we did quite a few of those last year and they were massively successful. And we were planning on doing more this year and putting the prices up a bit. Um, but obviously that wasn't to be. So um, yeah, it's just nice connecting with people and potentially these are all beef customers. Um, and we've got quite a lot of serious bird watchers now who are beef customers, um, which is great, um, which is really good. So that's going, yeah, so that's, that's a really good thing. Um, I'll just say a little bit about our direct marketing. Uh, let me find the picture I was after. Um, but yeah, okay, I'll just speak about this one. So we also do um, quite a lot of uh, uh, things, well, sort of radio interviews and things like that. So we've got some friends who run a local radio station in Swindon. And uh, so that's really good. Um, they're always after content and a lot of it they syndicate onto the BBC. So at the moment we're doing a virtual farmer's diary with them. And there's lots of opportunities out there to do this. Um, you know, all, all media outlets, they want content. And, you know, living on a farm with animals and wildlife, like lots of you, there's, there's so many opportunities to do this. Um, they don't all end up in instant sales, but um, it's fun things to do, even if the kids kind of misbehave while you're trying to do it. But um, it kind of, yeah, it's, it all adds, it all makes it interesting. I think it makes it uh, an interesting place to be and an interesting life. Um, so I'll dash on to direct sales. Uh, right. The right. So what we do, um, don't know whether you can see that. So uh, you have to turn your head around a little bit. Um, so at the moment we're selling two animals a month. Um, we're getting them slaughtered at our slaughterhouse about half, well, 40 minutes away in Stroud, and then they're delivered back to us the next week. So we had all these fridges for turkeys, so we've always uh, done our turkeys ourselves. So for two weeks, well, a week, 10 days a year, where we had these fridges um, used, and for the rest of the year they weren't being used. And we had, so we, we converted my father's old milking parlour, uh, filled in the herringbone pit, put some fridges in, in the dairy room, took out the bulk tank, and that's our kind of butchery area. And so we talked to the HO and she was said, yeah, you can do more. So we actually use those facilities now for the beef. We also use them for my sister-in-law's uh, Oxford Dam sheep flock. And that's where I've been this morning, cutting lamb carcasses. Um, and so and we've also got a couple of deer in the free fridge as well. So we're doing, um, going from just doing a few turkeys, we're now do, gonna do 500 turkeys this year. We we'll do 24 bodies of beef, about I think about 30 lambs, and um, hopefully a few deer. And this is all really, uh, yeah. So it's, the people are out there. We're lucky. We've got an affluent population, relatively close. Um, we're not big into mail order at all. We do an odd one or two. And the, the sort of model that we've done, which is based on the turkeys, is that people turn up to the farm to collect, and that we try and get all those collections into as small a period of time as possible. So we're not open generally. We have a Saturday morning. We're open for an hour at my brother's farm, an hour and a half here at my farm, and all the transactions. So 80% of the meat is out fresh in that period of time. And it's worked really well up until COVID-19. So what we're doing now is free local deliveries. And um, yeah, that's kind of, that's working. Um, it's, yeah, it's forced us to actually build a website with a shop on. Beforehand, people just emailed me what they want, and uh, I took card payments on the day. Now we're doing nearly all of it through the website. Uh, quite a small number of choices, really, of boxes, about six different choices. And then with each of those, they can have a variant, which is extra mints. Um, so we like using the Pasture for Life QR codes, and you've got the batch number on there, so you can check traceability. Um, and yes, yeah, so the meat sales are going, going really well. We lost our butcher, so he wouldn't come due to COVID-19. Um, he's, he's fairly elderly. Um, and so I've cut three animals myself. Um, so watching YouTube videos, 
but the last two we did was um yeah sort of i lost my sense of humor to be quite honest doing it and we were up there till midnight and it was yeah so i've got a new local butcher coming to help us this time and uh got some other help with the packing so it should should work so yeah the direct retailing is not um it's not easy but you know we're now sort of uh you know this can, we're, the target income from an animal is sort of two and a half thousand pounds, if not a bit more on some of them, um, which is very different from, and then we're selling them now at, well, between 18 months and 23 months, they're going fat. Uh, and that is actually a bit younger than what they were being sold as heavy stores, some of them. So that's the mob grazing and the genetics coming through is all helping that. Um, so yeah. That's what we're up to. Um, uh, right, I'll just very quickly. So um, there's a few other, uh, let's have a look, things that are sort of on our horizon. So yes, okay. So we'll just show you these. So we've got a Wix website, um, which seems to work for us. Uh, let's make that bigger. Oh, sorry, it's a bit small, but anyway, you can visit uh, andyrummingsbeef.co.uk and that's very easy for us to manage and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's fine. Ah, here's some of our silver steaks. So I really like this picture. So look how yellow this fat is. And um, no matter what the experts say, our customers, no one's got a problem with this. And I think that, you know, isn't it amazing that you're you know, just off grass, that your animals can produce this. You know, it's, this is well marbled, this is from Hereford. Um, and that fat almost like glows, it's like luminous. So um, yeah, why would you throw it into the general supply chain? Um, so we're still putting animals at market at stores. In fact, some went today, but uh, you know, our goal is to put everything, everything through our own supply channels. Um, and I think we can get there. It's just trying to do that in a really organized way. That means that we, um, yeah we don't uh we don't lose control and we're focused and it works so this is a project that um was meant to start first of april so i'm actually sat inside here at the moment in the back so um so i want to sort of layer up the enterprise as i said so we've got the cattle i want to do some tourism but i want that tourism to fit in with the farm so we're going to go for some glamping and so i bought this lorry on ebay and um uh, I've converted it to for sort of just for a couple really. So it's, it's got a bed in the back, little kitchen in the front. This folds down to a patio area, and then there'll be a separate uh, shower and um, sort of uh, toilet area in another little trailer. Bought another horse trailer, and so we're going to have this permanently site in the corner of the farm. It's meant to open the first of April, um, but I wasn't really ready, so I've got a bit more time to sort it out. So the idea is this will fit in harmoniously with the farm um, as extras, they can obviously buy steaks. And if this works, there's definitely potential to do sort of three or four of these. Uh, and then the other sort of diversification that I'm looking at really quite seriously, but that is quite difficult is, if I can find one, is, let me find the picture, is about, is the leather side of things. Um, and I've been, doing some here we go right so i'm interested in taking all my hides into finished leather and so i have i've had some done and i've been making belts just as a hobby really and selling them and uh if you get it right there's as much money in the leather as the meat which is nuts really but that's true um but the tannery capacity in britain to provide what I want is is not really there um, uh, so I am looking at whether I can build a micro tannery which is um, pretty challenging actually you can't just go on the internet google it and copy one um, the barriers to entry are really high which actually I see is probably a good thing because once you can do it you won't get that many people copying you 
so anyway so this is something i'm working on um and uh we will see where it leads but i mean at the moment we're hearing on the forum that people are being charged for the disposal of their hide which is which is just nuts um uh whereas you take it into belts like that and as i said it's worth more than the, all the meat of the whole animal so um yeah so that's what i'm looking at doing at the moment so should we uh should we leave it there a minute yeah i think that's great thank you very much andy for a really quick and interesting overview 